This is Saving Stormwater by Stormwater Go. Our host is Preston Vaudry, Director of Social Media, joined by Carl Adams of the Utah Department of Water Quality. Topics include stormwater effects on citizens and how they can help keep our water clean. Welcome to the Saving Stormwater podcast. My name is Preston Vaudry, Director of Social Media. Today, I'm joined with Carl Adams from the stormwater section of the Utah Division of Water Quality. Carl? Howdy. Uh, my name is Carl Adams, and I've been with the Division of Water Quality for about 20 years now. Uh, that will be in November. And the majority of that time was with the uh, what was originally known as the TMDL section. TMDL, an acronym standing for Total Maximum Daily Load Program. And... Uh, eventually became the watershed protection section when we absorbed the non-point source uh, water quality program and worked there for many years. And just in the last three or four months or so, I've uh, shifted gears and moved into the stormwater section. And my background is uh, in large part uh, sediment erosion control practices, what we refer to as best management practices uh, to protect water quality, uh, improve the environment, and um, avoid uh, problems and issues down the road by uh, practicing good land management uh, practices. And so I think a lot of that uh, experience and uh, uh, information that I gained through those years are directly applicable to the stormwater program. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I kind of just wanted to get your, I guess, your raw, fresh opinion. Um, right before we started the podcast, we were uh, looking at a video of uh, looked like a manatee that was mm. consuming just raw stormwater pollution just right out the drain um, off a of bay in Florida, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah, uh, that is, I think, going to become more common uh, as there are more individuals out enjoying the environment, particularly, uh, you know, our waters, uh, streams and lakes, uh, not only in Florida, uh, where there's a lot of water and yeah. <laughs> uh, outdoor recreation, but here in Utah as well. Um, the population is rapidly growing and people want to get out, you know, big draw. For sure. the state of Utah is outdoor recreation, and because water is so limited here in Utah, uh, I think the uh, draw for folks is even greater here than it might be in somewhere like Florida. Right. Um, and you know, in our urban areas along the Wasatch Front, you know, we have a number of uh, very popular water bodies that, in the past, have uh, been kind of considered uh, not good places for recreation because of, you know, the stigma of, you know, being um, associated with uh, sewage disposal and uh, some of those past land practices that have now been uh, shifting to more residential and, you know, light uh, kind of intensity land uses. Um, and so the potential for folks to see things that they don't uh, like. Yeah. <laughs> things like uh, stormwater outfalls, you know, that yeah. can be at times very dirty, um, will I think increase and begin to receive, you know, more reports and yeah. questions about where this water is coming from, where is it going and what the effect is on the environment. Yeah. Uh, you know, as we refer to as the receiving waters. Um, in the state. So Utah Lake, Jordan River, sure. you know, two major water bodies in the state that uh, have you know suffered uh, their share of abuses over the years. Um, but you know, I'd like to also mention, you know, the course of history, those uh, uh, injuries, I guess you could call them over the years have been in large part addressed, but there's a ways to go yet. On, yeah. Uh, getting to where you know we want to be in terms of yeah. water quality so so um, you said you've been with um you've kind of been doing stormwater stuff for right around like you said 20 years right uh yeah stormwater indirectly the tmdl non point service yeah. program directly so and so. you've kind of mentioned some stuff uh you know a little bit on mm -hmm. the 
um, uh, kind of we've gotten on the outskirts, but what is something mm-hmm. you've seen over 20 years that has gotten better? What's things that have gotten worse? What's, uh, you know, in terms of stormwater pollution, I mean, if we were to address this exact situation, mm-hmm. right, what would be the exact way that you would say Utah could get better at limiting well, our think, stormwater pollution? Okay. Um, well, I think the first step is acknowledgement and understanding of the situation Uh, and a large part that can be gained through monitoring uh, through eyes and bottles in the field bottles to collect samples to analyze to understand what is uh, really getting into the water there's the visual aspect you know the turbid dirty water which um, can be very shocking but in certain cases may not be that uh, big of a problem for the environment. You know, sediment moves. uh, I've heard it said, I believe a professor at Utah State said one of the functions of streams and rivers is to transport sediment. That's kind of a natural function. But in our urban settings, uh, cities and towns, um, that can be greatly increased with, you know, the practices, land management we employ, uh, construction development, um, and just good housekeeping principles, you know, Mm -hmm. that we maintain both in residential areas, in our homes, in our yards, and also, you know, streets and parking lots and industrial facilities, et cetera. Sure. So um, the information that is rapidly becoming more easily available Mm-hmm. Um, for example, stormwater monitoring itself in the past relied on people watching the news reports, uh, weather forecast and uh, running out when it started raining. And nowadays there are automated sampling stations uh, that are available to, you know, you remotely trigger them with a cell phone and they will collect the sample uh, for you and so really it becomes yeah much more uh, feasible much more um doable uh nowadays do we have those here in utah we do there are a couple and we are looking to uh, expand that network of these automated sampling uh stations in the near future so that's awesome Mm -hmm. that's awesome what um how does doing like sampling just kind of for people who may not know Mm -hmm. how does doing sampling consistently how does that help to kind of reduce stormwater pollution how does that help to raise awareness what are kind of the the key points to hit there with the samplings well it's really tying the uh the results of those samples so for example you know, the turbidity uh, level, uh, the amount of sediment or how cloudy the sample is, tying that to, you know, particular areas that drain into that storm system. Sure. Um, you know, could identify uh, problem areas or, you know, hot spots of yeah. sediment pollution going in. Uh, things like uh, nutrients, uh, phosphorus, nitrogen could implicate or, you know, point the uh, direction to what types of uh, fertilization practices, sorry, uh, (laughs) are being used in that drainage area or, you know, is it a agricultural area with uh, a lot of livestock that, you know, you need to focus on manure management, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's a lot of information about adjoining land uses that can be gleaned from sampling um, and then helping to prioritize and uh, direct, you know, efforts to uh, reduce those sources as well. You know, when you're starting with no information or just observational information by you know, walking or driving around, um, that, you know, is important and useful mm-hmm. uh, to understanding what's going on. But the data provided through the sampling and monitoring um, is, you know, uh, additional and can be, you know, much more uh, definitive, I'd say, than the kind of qualitative observational data. When you mm-hmm. And, you know, another aspect is you can see changes through time, you know, and evaluate how effective your uh, best management practices, sure. controls, have been through time. And so yeah. um, it provides not only information about the here and now, but uh, if you continue through time, 
also yeah. provide information on uh, it's kind of like a, a grade uh, report yeah. card. Yeah. So what would um, what would you say are some of the A's on that report card versus, you know, some of the C's, D's, hopefully mm. not very many F's that yeah. you know, <laughs> we, we have going on kind of in, in storm water in our in kind of our community? Well, you know, I like to take a little longer perspective in terms sure. of water quality. Uh, look back, you know, generations ago and yeah. how our streams and lakes were managed at the time or uh, not managed uh, yeah. as the case may be. And uh, boy, you know, I've heard stories. I wasn't around back then. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, of you know, industrial wastes being uh, directly discharged with no treatment or yeah. prior treatment, sanitary wastes, you know, human waste essentially. They just change your oil right on top of the storm drain, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, some of the agricultural practices uh, in the past, you know, uh, mortalities of livestock would uh, be disposed of i've heard really in, in the riverways or at least uh, the you know mortalities would find their way to the river you know the livestock and uh so they, just leaving they, dead they, cows they right there as i've been <laughs> as i've wow. heard stories have told of That's old intense. so uh we've come a long way since then um our wastewater treatment uh practices are much much more advanced uh, right. Uh, right now I believe there's you know quite a few throughout the state who are uh, beginning uh, the design and construction of advanced wastewater treatment uh, technologies, what they call tertiary treatment, um, which will you know, help reduce the amount of nutrients uh, being discharged into the receiving waters, uh, such as Utah Lake or the Jordan River, mm -hmm. ultimately the Great Salt Lake. Yeah, and um, so in that. You know, respect. I think we've come a long, long way. Uh, the, you know, a lot of the municipal discharges uh, from the treatment plants are disinfected, um, so you know they're no longer a uh, concern for disease-causing organisms and right. such. Um, but you know, the big distinction, of course, we're talking about stormwater. Yeah, is stormwater is not treated uh, right. here in Utah, and. Um, you know, generally the risk is a little lower in terms of health uh, effects, but there are st some still. You know, right. We've picked up um, E. coli, which is you know bacterium in the gut of warm uh, blooded animals, mm -hmm. and uh, that you know could potentially make somebody with a uh, compromised immune system or very young individuals uh, sick. So um, some of that. You know, can be attributed to our uh, activities. You know, big fancy word is anthropogenic activities, man associated or man caused. Uh, but then there's the natural background, the waterfowl that obviously use our streams and lakes as well. Right. Um, and so there's, we're getting to the point now, I think, with you know, some of our data and information, we, uh, have to take a really hard look at what is controllable and what's not mm -hmm. um, in terms of you know setting our goals and, and priorities for uh, water quality improvement projects right. um, and so um, that's kind of a, a sideline you know and then the other perspective is you know we uh, should be doing everything feasible and affordable and logical yeah. <laughs> that we can to protect water quality. Um, one of the uh, observations, you know, I've made in uh, particularly here in Utah and where it's, you know, water mm -hmm. is a limiting factor um, is that, you know, we have a finite amount of, of water, uh, but the amount of clean water versus not clean or not usable water mm -hmm. uh, is kind of what we need to work on. Um, right. That we need to keep the water as clean as we can for as long as we can, um, so that it can be used by you know the natural environment, by the fish and the streams, by us as humans for irrigation purposes or for right. culinary drinking water purposes. But once the water gets uh, tainted to a certain point, you know it becomes too expensive to. Uh, purify or clean up for other uh, purposes. So yeah. um, that's you know kind of a roundabout way of saying <laughs> uh, we have done, you know, made a lot of ground, gotten a lot better, yeah. uh, but we have uh, quite a ways to go yet. Yeah. Still, especially. So you, uh, you kind of glossed over some of like the, um, 
there can be some health detriments when it comes to storm water pollution mm. and you know uh, nutrients mm-hmm. ending up in, in water pollution would you mind expounding on that a little bit you know sure. kind of uh, some things that can happen if we don't properly take care of our storm water mm-hmm. i'll try not to get too far down rabbit hole <laughs> sure <laughs> the details <laughs> yeah uh but long and short is you know there are consequences to uh or reactions to everything uh that gets in the water um and so for example you know one of the issues that have uh, come up in the last few years it's been present for quite a bit longer probably since time immemorial but uh, with the uh, monitoring that we've conducted and the analyses that are now available uh, we've gotten a much better understanding of uh, harmful algal blooms which is caused by blue-green algae or cyanobacteria that uh, tend to uh, really uh, explode or bloom, as they say, harmful algal bloom, when nutrient levels are uh, high. And Mm -hmm. here in Utah, uh, we do have a lot of uh, natural sources of nutrients. There's a lot of geologic formations with uh, phosphorus in them um, and, you know, natural sources of nitrogen, et cetera. And there's, so there's uh, plenty in the system to start with, just without any influence of uh, humans yeah. to support the ecosystem, aquatic ecosystem. Yeah, the, we're the certainly not helping fish. that, right? Well, in, <laughs> with additional amounts uh, that can, you know, upset the balance that had, you know, mm-hmm. formed over millennia past and um, in kind of a healthy, sustaining ecosystem. And so the additional loads associated with you know, society, um, called cultural eutrophication, um, can you know, tip that balance to uh, uh, benefit species that aren't necessarily beneficial for us, um, mm-hmm. like these blue-green algae. Um, there are you know, some outfits that will uh, harvest the blue-green algae and sell it as a dietary supplement, um, but you know, the immediate effects in the environment of blue-green algae can be very detrimental. Um, And so I'm struggling hard not to (laughs) dive headfirst into that right hole. But, um, and other health effects, um, you know, obviously uh, cross connections to uh, sanitary systems with the storm drain system, you know, that's Mm -hmm. still... um, a issue in some areas you know, sure. that have uh, historically used, uh, well, did not have centralized uh, sewer systems uh, installed or constructed. And, you know, one of the concerns of late uh, that has come up is with the uh, growing population of transients that live along our waterways and what do they do um, when they need to use the restroom. Uh, oftentimes it's not sanitary right and so um, those are you know some of the issues that I think that are being dealt with on many fronts not just from a you know, water quality perspective but from you know human health or uh, yeah. you know, legal kind of or um, trespass and vagrancy right. and all those types of other issues as well so yeah um, it's So maybe in a way to dumb it down for someone Mm -hmm. like me. So if I were to go swimming in the Jordan River, right, and I were to accidentally drink, let's say, a glass of water from the Jordan River that happened to be around an algal bloom, Mm -hmm. you know, what would, you know. I think by and large, the immediate effect would be you'd have a tummy ache and you need to stay in bed for a couple of days. Now, you are a young, uh, healthy individual, Mm -hmm. uh, prime of life, so to speak. And so that could be the worst of, you know, the consequence for you. Right. Uh, however, you know, if a young child were to, you know, say three-year-old. Sure. Get into the river, do the same thing. It could be uh, you know, a more difficult situation. Right. Um, so, you know, the uh, regulations, the standards that we uh, have to protect the population, you know, human health, uh, is really designed to, uh, focus on the most vulnerable uh, portion of our you know, society. So, um, whereas it may not 
land you in the hospital. It could potentially land someone with an immune, you know, uh, yeah, immune system issue. Yeah, and um, so that's kind of where uh, the you know, basis of the standards. Well, I, I appreciate the compliment. I am in, immunocompromised, <laughs> so it might actually have an effect mm. on me at some point. Okay. But, um, but that's that's good to know. I don't think I'll go swimming in the Jordan no. River anytime yeah. soon. <laughs> um, so one thing I did want to touch on is um, so you and I do quite a bit of work with uh, MS fours, and um, that can be kind of an interesting relationship between you know the state mm -hmm. and the EPA and municipalities when it comes to. Um, maintaining their uh, their permits mm -hmm. and you know trying to educate their people on stormwater. Uh, one thing we've kind of noticed is that a lot of MS4s they try and do their best, but the most they can do is slip it into a budget meeting at the end, or mm -hmm. um, you know just kind of the end of something, and they kind of try and cram it in there. Um, do you have any tips? Have you seen any strategies that have worked more often than others in terms of trying to educate? You know, mm -hmm. municipalities, because, you know, that's kind of where we see a starting point. Yeah. So. Well, coming from kind of the watershed background, which, you know, has been that term is used a lot nowadays, but really, and I think there's some uh, different uh, interpretations of what it means. For me personally, watershed is essentially just an area of land, you know, a large area of land right. defined by topography, um, where the dr water drains and where it collects and where it ultimately, you know, exits that particular watershed. Sure. Um, and understanding a community of municipalities uh, setting within that watershed is, I think, very important. Um, if you don't know where you are, <laughs> you can't, it's yeah. really hard to figure out where you want to, where you want to go or where you want to be. Yeah. Um, and so understanding kind of the setting, what the uh, drainage pattern through their community is, uh, discharge points, et cetera, where that ultimately ends up is really the first step in uh, kind of appreciating the role these communities play in their uh, you know, citizens environment. So um, understanding um, yeah, they're setting. And there are a lot of opportunities more so nowadays than there were in the past for uh, larger groups to uh, collaborate, yeah. talk and uh, help, you know, their constituencies appreciate their setting. Um, I know, sure. you know, for example, there's the Utah Lake Commission, the Jordan River Commission. Oh, yeah. Um, there's, you know, the Provo River Watershed Council. There's yeah. a whole number of these uh, kind of locally based, but extra territorial, I guess, uh, organizations, you know, watershed based organizations that are doing really great work nowadays uh, with educational efforts and yeah. um, understanding you know, the kind of the big picture of you know, here's the sources of our water. Um, here's how we use it you know, within our city. Here's where it exits our system. And, you know, what are, what's the change from above down to below and really appreciating that kind of big picture as a starting point, um, I think is really critical for step to, uh, you know, communicate or to educate uh, the constituency on because well there's a you know saying that uh, we all live downstream so there's exactly always yeah. somebody <laughs> upstream that could affect us and by extension you know there's somebody downstream from us and that uh, yeah you know we need to take that into consideration when you know we're yeah. going about our day to day business sure yeah I, I've uh, I, like I kind of said at the beginning I'm, I'm one of the social media managers mm -hmm. for our group Storm Water Go and uh, you know I've seen different kinds of online campaigns um, I've seen um, just kind of occasional signs on you know in the street that say hey mm, yeah. only rain down the drain you yeah. know like kind of general stuff like that mm -hmm. um, and, and you know there's campaigns like for the Delaware which is something I've seen for the Delaware River mm -hmm. you know and um, I think really it just kind of comes down to putting a, a focus on, you know, stormwater and education and understanding that it is a big deal and it impacts all of us, yep. you know, so, um, 
I'm uh, I'm starting to get a little bit of a time signal there, so uh, <laughs> we'll see. I, we've only scratched the surface <laughs> of the stuff I wanted to talk about today, but we'll we'll see if I can figure out something specifically that we can talk about here. Um, you know what? I think I'll uh, I think I'll leave the last five minutes to you and give you the last little bit there. Um, is there one thing specifically, you know, we've got a, a bit of a social media audience. We've got a YouTube channel mm -hmm. um, and everybody that, you know, follows us. They have the opportunity to see what we're posting out there for free and we want them to share. We don't want this just to stay within our company. So yeah. what is something you would want to leave our listeners and, you know, potential um listeners of this podcast mm -hmm. what's something you want to leave them with that you know if you could leave one message with them okay they well, have that opportunity i don't think i'll need five minutes for it <laughs> um <laughs> sure I, I heard a saying once and you know i tend to accumulate these over the years but yeah uh, the world is run by those who show up and mm -hmm. that is a powerful statement that uh means to uh affect the change to be uh, part of the solution, uh, making our world a better place to live and, you know, uh, for not only ourselves, but our mm -hmm. kids and, and so on and so forth, uh, get involved by showing up. And, you know, that could be directly through, you know, public meetings, sure. um, through work groups. Um, but then nowadays, as you mentioned, social media and you know, the internet and such has yeah. uh, become much more uh, prevalent and powerful force uh, for communication is, you know, participating in online discussions yeah. um, and trying to be, you know, I come from kind of a technical scientific background. So I focus a lot on the uh, defensibility of, of information that I provide and, and statements I make. Um, and so I would also encourage <laughs> folks, uh, you may not have you know, technical background, but there's so much information available freely uh, through the internet nowadays. It doesn't you know, take much yeah. effort to find good information um, out there so that you are a educated and informed uh, citizen of, of our great state so yeah um i'd say you know do the research and um, make your voices heard um with feedback and and um always be open to you know other differing points of view um the world's a big place and so there are a lot of different perspectives and so we have to you know, appreciate and respect others uh opinions but ultimately you know without speaking up um your viewpoint may go unheard and that would be, uh, yeah, uh, not good. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> get involved, Definitely. get educated and, yeah. uh, and, and show up for the meetings. <laughs> Amen. Show up for the meetings. All right. Well, thanks for coming on. We appreciate it. Um, Carl Adams with Utah division of water quality, the stormwater division, yes. right? Awesome. Uh, section. Yep. Uh, stormwater section. Yep. <laughs> my bad. Um, all right. Thanks for joining us on the Saving Stormwater podcast. Make sure to follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, uh, YouTube, and Facebook. Wow. All right. <laughs> Thanks.